for class Environmental studies We're trying to be green Environmental studies We're staring at our screens Environmental studies We're trying to keep up Environmental studies But everything is Hi everyone and um, welcome to Environmental Studies 110. Uh, today we're going to talk about the formal powers of the president uh, and then we're going to talk about how those powers translate into one specific example of disaster management. So it's going to be kind of bringing together the two themes that we've talked about this week, the formal powers of the president and then how they're applied in crisis situations. Uh, and so today we're going to bring those two things together. And hopefully uh, all of that combined with the readings you've been doing about federalism and about presidential primaries will help give you a good sense of some of the formal structuring institutions uh, that govern policy making in the US, which is going to help you write your policy briefs and it's going to help you, you know, achieve the goals of the class, which is to like get good at getting involved in policy making. So hopefully that sounds like a plan. So I want to go over four important presidential powers to begin with. We're going to start with the most important one, probably, uh, which is the power of appointment. Um, choosing the team that is going to execute the president's instructions is one of the most important powers that a president has. And uh, they have a lot of freedom in who they can appoint. So if you're interested in making a difference on some policy, then personnel is policy. Uh, getting the right person in office can shift the direction of a whole agency, uh, including the Environmental Protection Agency. So it's not quite as powerful as a whole scale systemic institutional change, but um, one of the things that you can advocate for in your policy brief uh, is to change the person who's in charge of a given area. Uh, or in your lives, if you're looking at a policy, then it matter. you know, let's say you're in favor of Medicare for all, it will matter a lot who is in charge of implementing that. So getting the right person appointed is something you have to lobby and pressure the president to do, um, and because it can be really important. The president doesn't have total freedom for some appointments, most famously the Supreme Court, they have to get the advice and consent uh, of the Senate, which essentially gives the Senate a veto. Um, so you have to have uh, a majority in the Senate, a two thirds majority, um, in order to get the appointment through. And so in that case, the president could not appoint someone who a vast majority of the Senate was not gonna be in favor of. So popularity does matter because the Senate might be more likely to go against an unpopular president uh, than they would be to go against a, a popular president. And so there is sort of um, a more like democratically popular president has more freedom here because the Senate will be less willing uh, to oppose them. The other important set of presidential powers uh, come in the realm of foreign policy. So this is a place where the president has a lot of leeway. So if your policy brief is about something where um, it's about the relationship between two countries or two national units in some fictional universe, uh, the president is going to have a lot of power over that, and so they're probably the policy maker that you should address your brief to. So there have been famous examples in the past of environmental policies where presidents have gotten involved, uh, such as the Kyoto Protocol in 1998, which was one of the first treaties to deal with climate change on an international level, uh, but that was never ratified um, by the US Senate, even though it was signed by the president at the time, Bill Clinton. So even though the president does have a lot of freedom to negotiate uh, agreements, um, they don't always have the power to ratify them at home, and so the US never officially um, joined this treaty that they themselves helped negotiate. Uh, one of the reasons why the Paris Agreement in 2015, also on climate change, doesn't have any binding commitments in it is because the US wanted the freedom uh, to implement it as um, something that wasn't technically a treaty, because a treaty would have meant they had to get it through 
and the Senate, which was controlled by the Republican Party, and the Paris Agreement probably wouldn't have got through. So the President has a lot of freedom here, but if it's a treaty, it has to get through the Senate, uh, and so there's a role for um, like a broader coalition to get involved. Uh, the previous slide talked about the power of appointments. Appointing ambassadors is another example of that. So instead of you know, appointing the heads of domestic agencies, you appoint the head of your relationship with another country. And that's going to matter a lot for everything about that relationship, including uh, environmental policies. Uh, there's also a lot of important, um, you know, the biggest consumer of energy in the US is the Department of Defense. Um, there's no such thing as an environmentally friendly stealth bomber. Uh, and so the US president's um, extensive control over the military uh, is also something that has important environmental effects. So as you're thinking about how to analyze the presidency, how to understand um, whether there could be such a thing as a pro-environmental president, these are the types of decisions that the president makes that end up impacting the environment. Uh, another formal, like, constitutional power um, that the president has is the veto over legislation. So the veto essentially means that even if a piece of legislation gets through the House of Representatives and through the Senate, if the president doesn't sign it, it will not become law. Uh, they can veto legislation passed by Congress. That veto can be overridden by a two-thirds majority in both houses. So if there was an overwhelming coalition in favour of something, they could override the presidential veto. But just knowing that the threat is there um, is enough to change how Congress writes legislation. They don't want to have to get a two-thirds majority in each house. They would rather have the president just sign it. And so they might be willing to make concessions to the president. And so even if this is a power that hardly ever gets used, it's still important. It's still working behind the scenes to affect how Congress writes legislation. Congress can also try and write legislation to provoke a presidential veto. If there's an instance of divided government, so let's say the Democrats uh, control the White House, but the Republicans control the Senate and the House of Representatives, the Republican majorities in Congress might write legislation that they know the president is going to veto just because they want the president to have to veto potentially embarrassing um, legislation. But uh, finally, there's executive orders. So this is where a president changes the way that a law is going to be implemented. So some big changes in the US, such as um, the end of segregation uh, in schools and in the armed forces, uh, and various other policies have come about by executive order. So this is a, a directive that the president can do on their own to change how a law is implemented. So for your policy briefs, as you're writing them or thinking about what you might want to do, um, if there's already a law on the books, for example, the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, and you just want to change how an agency is implementing or interpreting that law, you might be able to do it with an executive order. Uh, this has been done on environmental policies in the past. So uh, an important one was 1369.3, uh, uh, which was an executive order from 2015 that said federal government um, buildings and infrastructure uh, were all going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 40% over the next decade. Uh, so this is a huge change. You know, we've talked about how much energy the Department of Defense consumes. The federal government on the whole, like all of their bureaucratic buildings and stuff, do use up a, a massive amount of energy. So even though this didn't, you know, introduce any new climate change legislation, just by changing the way that the government operated, the way that it executed its duties, a huge environmental impact has had. So those are four important formal powers that the president has. Um, they have the power to appoint people, they have foreign policy authority, they have a veto over legislation, and they have executive orders. Now, obviously there are many more, and there's all the informal policy, uh, powers that the president has, such as their popularity, um, and the, their ability to gain media coverage and the way that people look to them for leadership. But hopefully this gives you a sense of the role that the president plays uh, in US politics. We can talk about this more. Um, uh, people have already brought up some movies that the president was in, so we can continue this discussion. Um, but the idea is to get a sense of, uh, in policy making more generally, what is the role of the presidency uh, and the executive branch? So. I'm going to go and get another cup of tea.
Uh, and then we can talk about how these formal and informal powers were used during uh, some recent natural disasters. Okay, back in a sec. Ah, and we're back. Okay, so uh, now we're going to talk about an example of how the power of the president can be important during a natural disaster. So the example we're going to look at is Hurricane Maria, which was a 2017 hurricane that struck uh, a lot of the Caribbean um, and did a lot of its worst damage in Puerto Rico. The reason that Puerto Rico was particularly hard hit by Hurricane Maria was not just because it was a strong uh, category 4 or 5 storm uh, when it hit, uh, and because that island happened to be in the path of the storm, but it was also due to pre-existing uh, social, political, and environmental factors. Two weeks before Hurricane Maria, there had been another hurricane uh, that had exhausted a lot of their emergency supplies. I think one thing that we're realizing uh, a lot, you know, um, across the world now is that uh, even though there's one disaster occurring, that's not stopping other disasters. Um, it's not like they get spaced out. Uh, so there are still tornado warnings and hurricanes going on and all these other disasters to deal with, even as we're tackling the pandemic. Uh, and so one of the things that you see here is that the natural disaster um, wasn't just the hurricane, it was the fact that it came shortly after uh, a previous one. Now, uh, Puerto Rico economically had not been doing that great. Uh, it had been an official bankruptcy. Um, if, it's, if it were a state um, rather than a territory, it would be the poorest state below Mississippi. Um, a lot of the infrastructure on the island, like 80 plus percent of the agriculture was destroyed. All three and a half million people who lived on the island were left without power. Um, people died in flash floods, landslides, and due to the high winds. Um, and then in the months following the hurricane, which was you know, itself this devastating storm, uh, thousands more people died because of infectious diseases and because it wasn't possible to get medical supplies um, to parts of the island that needed it. Because a lot of the infrastructure and the roads had been destroyed, it was difficult to get power, to get clean water restored um, to these areas. And so this is the scale of the natural disaster. 80% of the agriculture gone, everybody on the island without power, uh, and thousands of people losing their lives. Now, when a hurricane strikes, it, um, the, the sort of level of damage that it does, you know, is partially going to depend on factors like the wind speed. Um, you know, the 64 casualties that happen as the storm is going on are related largely to, you know, the path of the storm uh, and what's called the eye wall replacement cycle and sort of where the strongest winds are happening. But the thousands of casualties that happen after are more related to the long-term social factors. So Puerto Rico has been governed by uh, imperialists for hundreds of years, uh, dating back to the African slave trade, when uh, 11, between 11 and 12 million Africans were enslaved uh, in the Americas, particularly between uh, the years 1600 and 1700, when tens of thousands every year were being brought uh, largely um, in the, uh, by um, sort of British carriers coming down um, and then uh, taking enslaved Africans to places in the Caribbean uh, and then taking goods back to sell in Europe. That pattern uh, extending over hundreds of years not only created you know, unimaginable human suffering at the time, uh, but also creates huge amounts of like suffering that still exists today. So land ownership is really highly concentrated uh, throughout the Caribbean. Most people uh, have a really difficult time owning land because the legacy of like plantation slavery uh, is that land ownership is still really concentrated. And so a lot of people are forced to live in the only housing that they can afford, which is on unstable and sort of remote areas. And so when a hurricane strikes, it exposes those people. Um, when 
you don't have much money, any expense can tip you over into not being able to cope anymore. A lot of people living paycheck to paycheck know exactly how much money they have, and if one thing breaks, like if they have to replace one extra light bulb or one extra tire, that is the expense that they can't afford. Um, and so it diminishes everyone's capacity to deal with unforeseen events. And that is the dynamic that we're experiencing today. Uh, people might have a rainy day fund, but not for this much rain. Uh, and so the sort of government stimulus trying to give people um, $1,200 each, it might help with some of these expenses. I doubt anyone um, you know, is like, going to be angry about it. But <laughs> it's not a way out of poverty. It doesn't deal with the like, longer term structural issue. You know, in Puerto Rico, it was about land ownership um, that was leading people to not be able to cope with natural disasters. In, um, like for a lot of people in the US, it's how do you deal with health insurance? Uh, how do you deal with unemployment? Um, $1,200 is not gonna fix that problem. Uh, and so in Puerto Rico, the thousands of casualties coming after the hurricane are more related to like the long-term poverty on the island uh, and the lack of state capacity. You know, if everyone um, is struggling to get out of uh, poverty, then the state is not going to have a lot of tax revenues and it's not going to be, it's not going to find it easy to provide government services. Uh, and so with the infrastructure damaged, uh, with people already in precarious position uh, and with sort of hundreds of years of neglect uh, and imperialism, um, it was, you know, unsurprising that a hurricane striking conditions like that would lead to a lot of casualties. Um, one of the things that I saw about, like, you know, the COVID um, pandemic is that it's like, you know, um, the pandemic is the black flight and the America is like the dirty motel room, you know? Um, it's also worth bearing in mind the environmental factors. So, you know, a lot of what we've talked about are the social and political factors that lead a place to be vulnerable to natural disasters, um, or that lead their, the effects of a natural disaster be, to be particularly bad. Um, but there's also environmental um, uh, vulnerabilities. So, uh, sugar was the major like export crop uh, in the Caribbean for hundreds of years, and that led to the environment changing. There was a lot of deforestation, a lot of coastal erosion, uh, because when you cut down trees in order to plant sugar, uh, you make the soil more easy, uh, like there's less roots keeping the soil in place, and so coastal erosion happens more quickly. Uh, when you're engaging in like a mono crop like economy, um, there's not a lot of economic flexibility, and so one bad weather event um, can lead to a lot of economic problems. Uh, it's also, I think, important to bear in mind that as well as the like economic vulnerability and the extensive poverty, as well as the environmental vulnerability, um, when you compare the response that the president had to uh, like the hurricanes that happened, Hurricane Harvey that happened in Texas almost at the same time, to the response to Hurricane Maria, um, there's a lot of like the, there's a big difference um, in the amount of money. Uh, and as we saw like earlier this week, presidents declare disasters um, in places that are battleground states. Uh, in Puerto Rico, they can't vote for president. And even though they're American citizens, they've got no representation in Congress. Uh, and so the incentives for elected officials to help are very, very low. Uh, there's also a lot of Republican opposition to the way that utilities are run uh, in Puerto Rico, they're run by the state. Um, and I think it's also worth bearing in mind that, you know, where Texas is 70% white, uh, Puerto Rico is 98% uh, Latinx, according to the most recent data that we have. And I think that it, you, you know, um, it seems to me that you can make a pretty compelling argument that those racial demographics played a very important role uh, in determining whose lives were seen as mattering when it came time to allocate uh, federal aid. Now I say this not as like to, you know, um, uh, just criticize the current president. Like uh, Obama 
had put Puerto Rico into bankruptcy administration, similar to, as we're going to see uh, later in the term, what happened in Flint, Michigan. And the point I want to make here is that um, putting uh, like emergency powers uh, onto a place and saying, look, you're in bankruptcy, uh, so we need to come in and impose measures to balance your budget, which is what happened in Flint and it's what happened in Puerto Rico. Often one of the first things that gets eliminated is preparedness for natural disasters. Uh, and also the way that the cuts are made uh, is by some external authority rather than by the people of Flint or by the people of Puerto Rico. So Obama uh, introduces this PROMESA Act, which puts someone else, uh, like an external board, largely made up of um, CEOs, uh, in charge of Puerto Rican finances. Uh, and the governor of Michigan puts an external overseer in charge of Flint's resources. And both of them end up making decisions that make those places more vulnerable to low probability but high impact events. And so, you know, we're likely to see a lot of financial uncertainty as a result of the current pandemic, right? And the instinct that a lot of people have is going to be, we need to make some cuts, we need to engage in austerity, and we need to keep stuff down. And that may or may not be the right thing to do, but the way that it's done matters a lot. And if it's an external person with no representation, no accountability, and no limits, then it's not a democratic way of making cuts, right? And that's what happened. That's what Obama did in Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico didn't have representation. And it's what happened in Flint. And we're going to see in both of those cases, there were some really negative outcomes as a result. So there's some final conclusions that I want to come up with. Um, but I think it's time for one more cup of tea. <sighs> okay. Um, so the final set of conclusions that I want to talk about from this week's material uh, are firstly, you know, the basic point that natural disasters are never natural. Uh, they may be caused by something that's outside of human control, but the effects that they have depend on human actions. And so, the, you know, starting at the very top um, and going all the way to the very bottom, everybody's actions will affect how uh, any natural disaster unfolds and how the costs of that natural disaster are distributed and how the burdens are shared or not shared um, between different members of society. Uh, and whether those burdens and costs are shared in a way that matches up with our ideas of justice, whether that matches up with our ideas about what's efficient um, and whose needs are prioritised. All of that is up to us. Uh, and given that most major decisions are made through this big government decision-making process that we call democracy, democratic incentives will affect the way we uh, react to natural disasters, just the way that they affect everything else. And so knowing that certain people have the vote and certain people don't have the vote affects everything about their life trajectory, including whether their needs will be prioritised during a natural disaster. Uh, we haven't even begun to talk about climate change, uh, which is this ongoing disaster. Uh, and so just as politics affects the way that we're reacting to this current pandemic, this is a preview of how politics is also going to determine how we react to climate change. And so um, figuring out how you can change political systems such that whatever natural disaster happens, everyone's needs are taken care of, and that responses do match up with our ideas of justice, it means that in some ways the work of improving democracy is the work of disaster mitigation, that the way we respond to a pandemic requires us to think about politics and democracy and what we want our society to do. Um, and so that's kind of the big thing that I want us to be talking about. I want to hear your thoughts of what you think a good government response to a disaster should be. What would your, like, you know, if we take one of these fictionalised dream presidents from a movie, how do you think they should be reacting to this? Uh, one of the ways that we could start thinking about this is to think about what, you know, 
what presidents have an incentive to do. What will they get more votes for doing, and what will they lose votes if they do? Um, how do you think that disasters are going to affect the places where they happen? Do you think that the politics of Puerto Rico has changed since the, or have changed since the hurricane of 2017? What about the reading that we looked at? Um, what are they asking for, for the future of Puerto Rico after this disaster? What do you think people are going to ask for in the US after this current disaster? The final reading that we did for today was kind of interesting. Um, the David Foster Wallace piece about what makes a good, well, it's kind of a, a look through of like a presidential primary, or at least, you know, how they used to happen. Um, but it does kind of get into this idea of like, what should a president be doing? What, why does he like McCain? What does he see as genuine about McCain or, or good and bad about McCain? And then I'd be interested to also see um, what you think about the parallels that we could draw between the candidates um, David Foster Wallace is talking about uh, and the candidates that were running in the, that are going to run the presidential election uh, this November. Um, finally, there's a section in the David Foster Wallace essay, you know, who even cares, who cares? And that, I think, is an interesting place for us to end our discussion for the week. Is it cool to care about politics? Um, is, it, is it something that is seen as like socially desirable to care? Um, I think that, that is a really important and profound question. Like, do we, is caring cool? Um, is politics a type of caring? Like, um, uh, why does politics feel so icky to so many people? Um, and I think that is something that I'm not going to say anything about because I want to hear your thoughts. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives us a good place to, to take discussion uh, this week. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the classroom of Google. Um, with that, take it easy. Um, good luck with all your work. I look forward to seeing your group presentations at the end of the week. And... Um, yeah, take it easy out there. Cheerio.